Good morning, people of God. We are grateful for dry weather, cool weather, to keep us awake today. Uh, thank you for joining us and being part of God's creation as we worship together during these uh, spaced apart, yet holy times where the Spirit draws us together. Thank you for your grace and your peace and your mercy that comes through God that joins us together today. Hopefully you will have received your worship guide as well as you're able to be tuned in to our station today, uh, as well as your communion uh, packet. Hopefully you will have that. And if you haven't used that before, you might want to just play with the cellophane part that uncovers the bread or the host. And then there's a second wrapper or a second covering that covers the, uh, the cup for the juice. So you might want to just have that ready and make sure you know how to um, manipulate or remove those coverings when we get to that place in worship. This is the day God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Hebrew scripture is from the 32nd chapter of Exodus verses 1 through 14, and this is when the Israelites forged a golden calf. Moses was an extremely long time in returning from the mountain, and when the people saw this, they turned to Aaron and said, Come and make a god for us, someone who will lead us. We don't know what has happened to that Moses, who brought us up from the land of Egypt. Aaron replied, Remove the gold earrings you are wearing, wives and husbands, sons and daughters alike. 
bring them all to me. All the people brought their gold earrings to Aaron. Aaron took the gold, melted it down, cast it into a mold, and made it into a calf, a young bull. Then the people said, Israel, here is your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before the idol, proclaiming, Tomorrow we will have a feast in honor of Yahweh. In the morning the people rose early, sacrificing their offerings and bringing communion offerings, and then they sat down to eat and drink and lost themselves in debauchery. Yahweh said to Moses, Go down now. These people whom you let out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. In such a short time they have turned from the way I have given them and made themselves a molten calf. Then they worshipped it, sacrificed to it, saying, Israel, here is your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Yahweh then said to Moses, I look at these people, how stubborn they are. Now they lead me to myself, so that my anger may pour out on them and destroy them. But you and I'll make a great nation. Then Moses sued the face of Yahweh, his God. But why, my God, should you let your wrath pour out on these people whom you delivered from Egypt with great might, with strong hand? Why should the Egyptians say their God intended to destroy them all along, to kill them in the mountains, to erase them from the earth, turn your back on your rage, reconsider the disaster you intended for your people. Do not forget Sarah and Abraham and Rebekah and Isaac and Leah and Rachel and Jacob, your chosen ones, to whom you promised I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give you all this land which I have promised. I will give it to your descendants, and they will enjoy it in its inheritance forever. So Yahweh will enter. And the disaster that threatened the Israelites was forestalled. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. I get to bring you the children's chat today, but I really invite you all to connect. I'm up here in this car way up in the front. Um, so um, I want you to think for just about 30 seconds and maybe share in your vehicle about a place, maybe a piece of land, a home, a building, a, um, a place that is really important to you. Take about 30 seconds to think about a place that's important to you. Go ahead. seconds to share and to think. So we've been going through the Beatitudes and today we're going to talk about blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Now the Beatitudes were given in a special place up on a mountain and this is where Jesus told them all about God's kingdom and you can think of kingdom as the way the world works or is set up. And in God's kingdom, there is abundance, more than enough honor, food, money, love, power, and resources for every child of God to thrive. So Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And when people listening to Jesus heard this, they immediately recognized it. Their worship songs and prayers, the Psalms, spoke of this. It says, the humble will have land, for their own in Psalm 37. And land, just like the, the places we find important, land was very meaningful. To own land was to have a place in your community, to have honor, and to have a way to provide for your family. But most of the people Jesus talked to did not own land anymore. Landowners in their time were hated because they used violence to take that land. 
And this is where Jesus starts to turn things upside down. With this promise, Jesus says that the meek, the gentle, the kind, humble people are the ones who will receive land, not the people who use force and violence, and not just the physical land of Israel where they lived, but the whole earth. This also holds a powerful message for us about caring for the earth. How do you care for the earth? Meek or humble people live with an awareness of others' needs, the planet, animals, and other people. They remember that all the earth and land belongs to God. They recognize how everything they have and receive, including land, belongs to God. And they take care of it that way. And that means using what they have with respect and love. There's a good phrase that I'd like to invite everyone to remember. I am God's child, and everyone else is God's child, too. Let's say that together. I am God's child, and everyone else is God's child, too. This reminds us of two important truths. You are special. You are a special and beloved, unique child of God who deserves love and respect. And each person around you is another special, beloved, and unique child deserving of love and respect. This is what a meek or humble attitude looks like. It means you don't see yourself or your needs as more important than the needs of those around you. When we are meek, we are truly free. We realize everything and everyone is a gift worthy of love and care. So I would like to bless you now. So a blessing is something you receive, so you can hold your hands open in front of you. And if you receive it, you take your hands and put it on your heart. God blesses you because you are gentle and kind to others. Amen. Thank you, Allison. The Gospel for this day is from Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then Jesus spoke to them again in parables, and he said, The kingdom of heaven is like this. There was a ruler who prepared a feast for the wedding of the family's heir. But when the ruler sent out workers to summon the invited guests, they wouldn't come. The ruler sent other workers, telling them to say to the guests, I have prepared this feast for you. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding. But they took no notice and went off to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized the workers and attacked them brutally and killed them. The ruler was furious and dispatched troops who destroyed those murderers and burned their town. Then the ruler said to the workers, the wedding feast is ready, but the guests I invited don't deserve the honor. Go out to the crossroads in the town and invite everyone you can find. The workers went out into the streets and collected everyone they met, good and bad alike, until the hall was filled with guests. The ruler, however, came in to see the company at table and noticed one guest who was not dressed for a wedding. My friend, said the ruler, why are you here without a wedding garment? But the guest was silent. Then the ruler said to the attendants, bind this guest hand and foot and throw the individual out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are called, but few are chosen. Holy wisdom and holy word. Thanks be to God. Many are called, few are chosen. I am called not to preach on the gospel text today. <laughs> so I'm going to focus our thoughts this morning on the Exodus reading. And I think about this reading and I pray along with the Israelites who watched Moses ascend. How long, oh God, how long, how long? The journey of faith is one that embodies the ups and downs and the joys and struggles, fulfilled desires and deepest discouragement and disappointment, as well as every thought emotion and emotion betwixt, between, and beyond. An embodied and active and living faith remembers that God is with us all and all of humanity every step of the way, even 
perhaps especially in the moments of the deepest valleys of darkness. While oftentimes we desire the church and our worship and God and Jesus to just give us a message that makes us feel a little bit better and uplift us, or at least help us feel like we're together, it's from this place of deep awareness and acknowledgement and pain and even apathy that we sense that something or a lot of life in the world is broken and battered and betrayed. And if a word from God or the church doesn't speak to it, we turn to insatiable self-help substitutes that lead us down a path of idolatry. That's not to say that God doesn't work through means other than the church and that God only speaks through scripture or preaching, but being aware of our human condition and all the hopes and expectations therein oftentimes leaves us yearning. Sometimes, perhaps often, when we overlook or fail to tend to our inner landscape, our thoughts and our whole body and what we're experiencing, when we fail to pay attention to our unmet expectations and dashed hopes and crushed dreams, left unchecked and unresolved, these might emerge from our soul as anger or depression or cynicism or even hatred. Now don't get me wrong, there is place and time for righteous indignation and anger which leads to just and loving actions. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't get angry or seriously question broken systems and relationships. Also, I'm not saying that being angry or cynical is unfaithful. Quite the contrary. Our faith invites and perhaps even instructs us in constructive and holy ways to move through times of unsettled hopes. Our Judeo-Christian faith offers an alternative way to tell our narrative and a way to frame or contend with the messiness of life and grief. And this is through an awareness and a practice of lament. If you haven't thought about lament before, think of it as a prayer in pain, a prayer in pain that leads so think of lament, uh, lament not as an end in itself or somewhere to get to. Think of lament as a language that meant, that's meant to create a liturgy, a call and response, something that speaks to God and God responds, something that leads us towards something else. A lament is leading us. So during our time together today, I'd like to lift up what I suggest is a story of lament which might help us open the stories of our lament and our hearts to be a gift for us and for God and for all as we journey through these weary, often unsatisfying, multiple pandemic days of racial reconciliation, political unrest, uncontrolled virus, and all the painful and unfulfilled desires of our being. Today, I invite you to see the infamous golden calf story through a lens of lament. This pain-filled story is part of the narrative of, God, narrative of God liberating an oppressed community out of slavery into the wilderness. They've experienced deep hunger and thirst and need of direction, of which God has abundantly provided through manna and quail and even water from a rock and words on the rocks, the commandments. We might even be able to hear their grumbling and complaining and pain, deep-hearted pain as a witness of lament, as we hear their voices resounding, take us back to where we were familiar with life and food and everything else. And we can hear in that they're saying we're scared. We hear them crying out, Moses has shown some pretty imp impressive feats, but we're not really sure we can trust him. And we can hear in that, have you brought us out here to die and to wither away? We hear that now that we're out here on our own in the wilderness, while Moses is doing who knows what, 
I can hear them crying in their hearts. I don't have the faith and the courage to get me through this alone. And we can hear their comment of how long is he going to be up there? How long, oh God, are we going to be out here? In their heart of hearts crying out, how long will we be without guidance? How long will this testing go on? And I suggest that where they fail to turn their attention to God is not by asking, how long, oh God, is this going to happen? In their unsettled and fearful impatience and unexamined expectations, rather than worshiping and crying out to God, letting their pain be held in the cradle-like valley of God's embrace, something in them, an idea wells up that they need to comfort themselves. Let's make ourselves feel better and at least craft an idolic golden pacifier. And then let's get drunk and orgy ourselves. Sex, drugs, and party on. That's how we feel better. That was not the feast. That is not the hope God had hoped. And it's in this story, in their hearts of crying out, that I suggest that the absence of lament turns people in upon themselves and they turn to their own devices, their own ways, losing sight of their developing trust in God or God altogether, as well as they begin to harm themselves and harm each other. And if you will allow me to join with you in reframing this story through a lens of lament, we might see also a second lament, not just from the people, but as the beloved community turns to their own devices, God laments. God laments. And it's disturbing to hear how God's anger wells up so much that annihilation of God's beloved community seems like the best possible solution to reconcile this mess. Just starting over seemed like the best option. And we might wonder, what happened to the God of liberation and mercy and compassion that God's anger was whipped out so readily? So apparent was God's pent-up disappointment that God eventually tries to disavow the idling community when God tells Moses, these are your people that you have led out of Egypt, seemingly blaming Moses for their infidelity. Now to empathize with God a little bit here and self-confessing, as a parent who has flown off the handle when our children have acted in undesirable and contrary ways than I've expected them, I confess and I identify with responding in less than compassionate, unchecked, insurmountable frustration. Sometimes in those moments, I've even said something similar to my wife. Gerilyn, those are your children. And in reflection here, I confess my unidentified lament. In this counterintuitive mountaintop experience, I suggest that God reveals a deep-hearted lament for and over the beloved community. And left unchecked, even God's indignation seems to come out sideways. God's dashed expectations and dreams and hope for this community are lost in the moment. But, in a twist of roles, Moses turns to the complaining God and curiously soothes God's face, evoking an image that the divine might also need human touch. Perhaps a touch like we are missing in these pandemic days. And it's fascinating how Moses intercedes for the people and turns the community back over to God. But why, my God, should you let your wrath pour out on these people who you delivered from Egypt with great might and a strong hand? Notice how Moses asks God to remember the promises, the covenant made with Sarah and Abraham and Rebekah and Isaac and Leah and Rachel and Jacob. 
your chosen ones, God's chosen ones, to whom you, O oh God, made these promises. It's here that I think Moses calls for God to be faithful and for God to trust in God's own capacity to love in the midst of lament. And God relents. In this reframing of the golden calf story, we might give it a new, non-traditional headline. The beloved community's lament meets God's lament. The beloved community's lament meets God's lament. And in the yearning for our trust in God to act and show us ways of being slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, the tension of holding these human and divine laments together are bound in God's promises of life and love. And in this narrative of lament, we might also turn in prayerful lament to God. How long, O oh God, how long? Mark Bergrop, in an interview on his book, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, and Discovering the Grace of Lament, teaches that lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust and involves turning, involves asking, or in short, he puts it in four words, turning, complaining, acting, and trusting. Turning, complaining, acting, and trusting. Rob goes on to say that lament allows us to vocalize our sorrows, and we're able to talk about the rumblings of our souls. Lament help us, helps us to be able to empathize with others, to be able to come alongside them, and to weep with those who weep. And lament also allows us to memorialize particular lessons so that we will not forget. So that vocalizing, empathizing, and memorializing are gifts of lament. He goes on to say that we can talk to God about our pain so that it can become a platform for renewed trust. So that when we ask, it's not only that we're asking God to act, but it's also that we are reminded that God's promises are really things that we do believe. And it's remarkable as we ask that we're not only pulling the promises into our world, but we're reminding ourselves that I do believe. I believe this because I'm asking. It's kind of counterintuitive, countercultural for us. I don't have to believe and then ask. I don't have to ask so that I'll believe. I have to ask so that I will believe. And we see that's what lament does. It helps us, it strengthens us, and then moves us to the final movement, the direction of trust. So the prayer of lament invites us to turn and complain and ask and trust. And trust is where all laments are designed to lead. And if we don't end in trust, perhaps we haven't lamented. We've just been sad. Bergrop makes this comment. I think Christianity is essentially a regular rhythm that through the sorrows of life, we in effect say to our soul, this is hard but I will trust God. And lament is the language to help us get there. There's an unbelievable level of grace that God gives us as we use this biblical story and language to help us traverse difficult pathways when we know and believe and trust that I believe God is good, but my life is really hard right now. And when we deal with the fact that grief is not tame, or something that we can tame or get under control, and that life is really difficult, this language of lament enters into that space and says, here's how you can talk to God and to one another when it seems as though all of life is falling apart. 
When the dark clouds roll in, he says, there's divine mercy, deep mercy available to you when we simply talk to God about our sorrows. Though not exactly a prayer in our hearing of the golden calf story, the people's lament and God's lament meet each other in a moment of God's shalom. A moment of God's peace is woven into the narrative, even if ever so brief. So dear church, as we live among God's global, beloved community, and walk as yet by faith with the loving God of creation who raised Jesus from the dead and lives and breathes among us through the Holy Spirit. Along with our crying out, how long, O God, let us also turn in lament and in faith and in hope to reframe our deepest pain and suffering through lament and complain, complain wholeheartedly, perhaps not in so nice language, honest and raw rhetoric, naming all the ways in which we are in pain and struggling and grappling and frustrated. Let us turn to God asking for that which will not only pacify, but for the grace to meet our deep, unmet, unfulfilled desires and needs of life and love. And then as we journey in our lament, may God's Spirit resurrect and awaken our trust and belief in God's goodness and mercy and compassion so that we may praise God for God's goodness. And through our laments, may we also experience the soothing touch of God deep in our being. For you, the world, we are among God's beloved in Jesus, now and always. Amen. In our trust, let us turn with the words of faith as in a form of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, eternal, almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the redeemer of all, the only begotten one who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, and lived and loved among us, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried, and who descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. Jesus, our Savior, ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of a loving God, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of those in need. Gracious host, fill your church with creation waits with eager longing for redemption protect your creatures that are mistreated restore valleys mountains and pastures and still and running waters savior in your mercy yeah. hear our prayer gracious host as you set a table in the presence of enemies so bless the efforts of diplomats international peace workers world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace prevails. Savior, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, let your gentleness be known among those who are weary or ill. Strengthen doctors, medical care workers, and caretakers who see their, who see to their needs. Savior, in your mercy. 
gracious host, when we are quick to judge outward appearance, remind us of how you clothe all in your mercy. We pray for ministries that provided needed clothing and other personal care assistance in the community. Savior, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For whom or what else do the people pray? Hear our prayer. Hear other intercessions that may be offered, gracious Lord, as we remember those who have died and are gathered in the heavenly banquet. Comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times. Savior, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We listen as we listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold your loving arms, all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I invite you to have your cups and wafer ready for our time of sharing in this holy meal, which God's the host. God be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. We give thanks to God. Thank you, God, for your grace. Faithful God, have mercy on us. And con we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. And we turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. And we place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen was the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it for his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then the same way he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So as we prepare to receive this gift of grace, we remember that God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrec re resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims in this meal that Christ Jesus is the host your sins are being forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. And led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. So as we prepare to receive, let us pray together in the spirit that Jesus taught. Our Creator in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This time you may take your wafers. And remember, in this bread, this is the body of Christ given for you. And in this cup, this is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard, to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of, of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for your gracious offerings. Thank you for your gracious presence and continuing bonding together, calling each other, wearing your mask, washing your hands, and caring for God's beloved community in the best ways we know. Thank you for your laments that also cry out, how long, oh God, will we continue to do this uh, and be apart from each other? There's no answer yet in sight, but we do know in November, starting the 1st of November, we will uh, move to a, a, a Zoom or an internet-based style worship. Watch for more information and we'll guide you through that process as days are coming. Uh, know that we will continue to be together during this time in which we are called to care and love for our neighbors by being a part. So receive this blessing for today. May God bless you and keep you. May God's grace and mercy of love bind you and hold you together in love. And may the love of Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Thanks be to God.